We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the dooms to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. Some of you have probably met Byrne already, but Byrne is uh, with us for the next oh, week, ten days, something like that. Yeah. Something like that. And Byrne told me yesterday that he first arrived here almost exactly forty years ago. So he's been coming That's when going. I was a student. When you were a student, yeah. Uh, he's been coming and going for many years. And he's coming. Oh, as long as we've been here, he's been in every few years probably, and stops in for a time and gives us some lectures. So, welcome. It's good to have you. Yeah. Yeah, Libri was totally different then. Uh, not totally. I mean, there's a lot of similarities. Otherwise, I wouldn't keep coming back. But uh, no, I I was here for three months. I was actually across the way at French Libri. There was a French Libri above Avion. And uh, we would come here a couple times a week, but we had our own little workers and stuff over there. But the funny thing is, and then I came back here. I ended up staying for about a year, but they never let me be a helper because at that time there were so many students applying. So I keep coming back. I keep thinking maybe someday. (laughs) I'll get to be a helper. So um, this is kind of an experimental lecture for me. We can, it's about the meaning of texture and what I'm calling it is preliminary notes on the meaning of texture. Because for me, this is the first time I've really discussed this subject. And normally the things I talk about here are things I've spent quite a while not only talking about, uh, I mean, uh, thinking about, but, but you know, I've presented the ideas somewhere before. But this time, uh, it's different um, for me. So, so it's kind of experimental. And, and in a sense, uh, I'm going to try to leave time for us to um, uh, ask questions and such. And I hope to get some feedback from you that will help me focus uh, my thoughts more on this subject. Um, texture. And, and every time I've said that to anyone here, they're, they look at me like, hmm, <laughs> you know, why are you talking about texture? What's the deal? What are you going to say about texture? What, what about texture? Um, it's been a subject brewing in me for a long time. Uh, some of you may know I'm also, uh, involved with puppetry, both on a, uh, practical level of, of uh, working with puppets and I started doing puppetry in Alaska back in 2005. Um, but also I've been studying it on a more kind of academic level, uh, learning the history of puppetry and such. And one of the things that really captured me about puppetry is the texture of the puppets, uh, that they're real. They're, they're made of, of often of fabrics like wood and, and I, I make them out of things like bone and driftwood and anything I can get my hands on, really. And texture has been very important in that. But I've been thinking about texture a lot longer than that. However, last year I was at... um, Well, I've been working on a documentary called Gravity from Above. And this is... uh, I One of the reasons I've been working on it is because as I was trying to tell anyone in Alaska that I wanted to be a puppeteer about puppetry, uh, they would... uh, didn't know much about it, uh, you know. Um, so I would show them visual material that I could find. Um, and I realized there was really no good documentary on the subject, so I decided I would do it. And because Europe has been the primary place where puppetry has intrigued me, I decided to make it about European puppetry. So last year, around this time, I was at the International Puppetry Institute in Charleville, mezieres in the north of France on the Belgian border. And I was uh, graciously offered a three-week residency there. Now, in the middle of this, they wanted a presentation on 
my uh, documentary, and I was kind of hoping, I knew, you know, I wasn't expecting them to get too involved with it or anything, but after the presentation, they decided to give me uh, backing for um, my project. So uh, that was really good. So I'm going back there after this and spending another month there, and I hope to find out how much they will give me in their 2019 budget. That's another thing. But the interesting thing is, as I made this presentation, one of the things I talked about was that I felt that as we moved into the 21st century, like as I looked at the 20th century, I thought that two of the major art forms of the 20th century were music and film. But I, how I felt both of these had been consumed now by digital media and the screen. And so, therefore, they no longer could function in any sort of questioning or adversarial way within society. And as I was thinking about it, one of the things that came to me as the thing that might be the thing which would arise later in the 21st century would be puppetry. And the reason I thought of that is because puppetry was exactly the opposite of all of our digital media. And, you know, some people have suggested things like video games and such, but to me it's like, it's all part of, what, you know, the industrial entertainment complex to uh, kind of paraphrase Dwight Eisenhower. And um, so we've got, uh, so much of us is, is drawn into the screen, is drawn into this flat space, um, that I thought te the, the texture of puppetry would provide an antidote on some level to that. Now, I didn't think that was the only thing that could provide an antidote, but I thought it was important. After it was over, they came up to me and said, what you were saying about texture? I said, yeah. I thought... This was common knowledge among puppeteers that, yeah, we work with this thing that's tactile that you hold up and it's like it's present in the room. And there's, you know, a lot of the puppet films I love have, like, Jan Schwankmeyer and the Brothers Crab, tons of texture within the, the, the mise-en-scene, the, uh, the placement of the characters and such. Uh, but, um, but they said, we never heard about that before. I thought, huh. So I started doing more research on it. It's a research facility. So I started going through looking for references to texture within their library. And they have all these books on puppetry, on theater, on the arts. There was like a book that dealt with fabric and clothing. That was the only place I could find it. Out of all the books, they had thousands of books. And I thought, hmm, that's weird. No one's thought about this before. So I, then I said, let's open this up a little more. Let's look online, see what else we can find. Blank. <laughs> you know, it was like hardly anything. There would be, uh, we'll talk about some of the things I did find, but but uh, there was nobody had seemed to ever deal with the subject before, and I thought this was really strange. Um, and I thought, given the increasing flatness of our environment, which is hard to understand here in Switzerland, where you have all these lovely little chalets with wooden interiors, and, you know, you've got the trees out there. But, you know, I just came back from Paris, where I was at the... Uh, the mall uh, at Les Halles in the middle of the the Paris. And this thing is just like <laughs> straight, angular, screens, windows, uh, uh, hard steel, plastic, uh, glass, all these really flat textures. And screens, uh, In just in case you're bored of your experience walking around through the mall, there are screens for you to look at, just like in Times Square there are screens. And so this is part of the world we're being moved into. Uh, the new cities are these massive, you know, Miami, uh, Shanghai, massive places with huge buildings. That's the world. Of, I mean, they, even our suburbs are this, uh, kind of flat, dead spaces, new suburbs. And so, um, let me tell you a little bit about some of the way I've been thinking about this. And like I said, I've been thinking about this for a lot longer than uh, I've been thinking about. This is the first time I put these ideas together. So when I, I looked, uh, like I said, it, I, I did. There is a book which I just got before I left and didn't have a time to to read it, but uh, by the puppeteer Jan Schrankmeyer on tactile art, and he did this art where you didn't see anything, and he had a box, and you stuck your hands inside of it to feel things, and I thought that was really interesting. And he did that. He did portraits of people. His wife said she was absolutely would never stick. His hand, her hands inside of the uh, the box he made of her because she was so afraid of what he'd do. Because this guy will use glass, he will use slimy textures. He will not. We're not talking about fluffy little stuff in there. He's talking about a real portrait of somebody 
And if you think about a textural portrait of something, you start going, wow. Um, but let's see. Um, so I did find uh, that in the, uh, and actually they didn't have it there, but they since have it. So one of the reasons I didn't bring my book along is because I, it'll be one of the books I'm looking at when I'm at the International Puppetry Institute. There, I did find online some writing about, uh, related to fashion and clothing. And, and I'll explain why in a moment that's usually where you find the subject of texture. Um, there's been a fair amount of writing on the subject of musical texture, but then that raises a question. How does that relate to the broader discussion of what texture is? Um, there's been hardly any scientific uh, writing on on the subject. There's a guy named Robert Herlich who uh, did work on the computer recognition of visual textures. Um, interestingly enough, he also did uh, work on uh, the biblical codes in the Torah. I don't know how those relate, but it, it just struck me as an interesting side note there. But he came up with two ideas. These seem to be the closest to scientific words that anyone's come up with. He He talked about a structural approach to textures based on Human, perce- uh, how we perceive them. So, you know, we perceive this, uh, as a, as a podium. We perceive what you're sitting in as chairs. We perceive, you know, uh, various textures that you're wearing and such. And the other one was what he called a stochastic approach, uh, random patterns. For instance, uh, it's a fairly random pattern on the, on the carpet. Uh, the leaves on the trees are in a fairly random Patterns, although we do recognize them as trees. Uh, if you go out into gravel, the gravel is always arranged in a fairly random pattern. Um, so that was his use. Um, but there's really no scientific uh, words uh, dealing, no scientific language dealing with texture. Um, the words we do use have very loose definitions. Things like smooth or rough, soft or hard, coarse or fine, matte or glossy, etc., etc. Uh, and, and one thing I have been thinking about this is, if you know anything about chaos theory in science, is that I think there's probably an overlap here between the concepts of chaos theory. For instance, wondering why clouds hover the way they do, why water moves the way it does, and yet it never repeats. There's an element of chaos to it, a stochastic element. But nevertheless, I think there's some probably connection here that hasn't been explored between chaos theory and texture. But uh, And as you're going to see in this... Uh, talk, I'm going to be throwing a lot of stuff out. It's just like, maybe this, maybe that, because I'm still thinking about this. So if you come up with any thoughts, I, like I said, I'm going to be happy to find out. Um, there has, of course, been much architectural writing, particularly on forms and shape. And yet, architecture seems to be, in part, largely to blame for the flatness that we find increasing in the world. And we're going to discuss this more as we go along. More importantly, there seems to be very little psychological writing on the subject, which means, what would it be like if you lived in a room, uh, lived your life in rooms that had the texture, say, of a refrigerator, white refrigerator? What would your life be like? What would you think? How would that affect your life? We don't know the answer to that question, but it is... I do have a little bit of a clue as we go here, but, but, you know, um, so it's just like, what is the psychological effect of texture upon us? And the fact that we don't know means we don't know what we're doing to ourselves by creating this incre- increasingly flattened, smooth world. Um, and, you know, there isn't even a Wikipedia entry on the subject which I thought was interesting. There's one for visual texture, but that's just visual texture. That's not, has nothing to do with even tactile te- uh, texture. There's one for musical texture, but then again, how does that relate to tactile and visual texture? Um, so what is texture? The word comes from the Latin texture, which means weaving. Uh, text, for instance, is a weaving of words together. Thus, texture is a, Kind of a, what I put together is kind of a description of the structural interweaving of the tactile elements of, of an object, the tactile dimensions of an object. Let me give you more, uh, to go on here. Merriam Webster's, probably the best uh, American in, uh, dictionary, dis- defines texture like this. The visual or tactile surface characteristics and appearance of something. Characteristics and appearance. Well, right there we have a, an issue. It's just like t- 
tactile, uh, let's see, uh, character, yeah, visual or tactile. You we're already in this kind of like, so what are we talking about? Area. Um, oftentimes when people describe texture, it's like it gets as loose as the words we use. Um, it, and they also say it can be a disposition or manner of union of the particles of a body or substance. Or the characteristics of feature substances, or the basic scheme or structure, or sometimes just the structure or the substance itself. So it's like, well, the definition's all over the place. Is it the thing itself? Or is like if I'm looking at this little table here, uh, is that, is this just being itself, a, a, being a structure? Is that texture? <clears throat> well, yeah, in some level. So again, I'm just thinking out loud here with you. So, um, uh, and of course, there are many, many references, direct references to woven fabric, which is, of course, where we really get the word texture. Are you listening, Tasha? Thank you. <laughs> She's working with her little fabric there, which is important. Um, so, uh, the Oxford, uh, the, the preeminent English language dictionary in England, says it's the feel, appearance, or consistency of a surface or substance. I think this is probably a little better than the American definition. Um, uh, it, it's the feel, the appearance, or consistency of a surface or a substance. It's still, there's a lot of room in there. Feel, appearance, consistency. Um, texture and tactility. Uh, this is really important. The sense of touch seems to be a key element. It's the way things would feel if you could touch them. For instance, uh, you could look at a painting, and and uh, now there's when we get to painting, we'll talk about two different ways in which texture can be used. But but just for instance, the you look at the the way the painting is, apart from actually touching it on the surface of the painting, and you get a feel of what it would be like if you could touch it, if you could be there, if. You could, you know, and so we talk about texture visually. So maybe that's one way of doing it. Texture descriptors, okay, oh, uh, te texture descriptors include things like rough, grainy, slimy, wooden, powdery, sharp, hard, soft, smooth. Things like that, as I mentioned before. Words that you kind of know it when you feel it. You know, if you pick up sand, you say that's grainy. You pick up powder, you go, that's powdery. You know, I, this morning I, I was uh, reaching for the black tea, but I actually reached into the used tea bag jar, which was overflowing. We'll have to discuss that at some point. <laughs> and I, thank you. And it, it was just like, I, I reached in and I was surprised by the kind of wet, slimy texture. And I was going like, whoa, get, out, get your hands out of there. That wasn't what I was expecting. Um, but smooth is a weird one. And I'll tell you why. It's smooth and flat. Uh, smooth. Uh, here's the weird thing. We use texture as a verb as well. To texture something. It means to add characteristics to something that's smooth. So then, maybe smooth is an absence of textures. I don't know. Like I said, I'm just thinking about these things out loud. And I don't know the answer to that question. But I do know this. Smooth is a big problem particularly in the world we are creating for ourselves. The flat smoothness of the screen, for instance. Yes? I think you have something interesting to say about that. If you allow me for a minute to... Yeah. Years ago, I read a book on, on pain, all its aspects. Mm -hmm. Just on this. It said there are people who feel certain textures of, of fabric as pain. And the cause is that as babies, they were only exposed to total softness around them. Hmm. And it was also talking about it that, for instance, babies in India who live uh, they, they, from early age on, they, they touch, their skin touches all textures, grass, concrete, sand, all sorts of fabric mats, bodies, and also all more of their bodies. And that somehow they are better connected to their surroundings because from early age on they are programmed to interact with textures and when they see it, there also is a subconscious feelings of them. Mm -hmm. And they far less suffer from unpleasant feelings of wet clothing or mm. clothing or hard clothing or whatever mm -hmm. because somehow they are much earlier programmed for those things. That's it is totally aligned with yeah. what you see that yeah. smoothness is yeah. not good for us. Yeah, uh, and I think it's interesting. I think what you're saying is uh, that's something I've never heard before, and I find it fascinating. Um, 
uh, we are creating a world, for instance, where we know there's some weird relationship, for instance, in food, uh, to the fact that we're living such clean existences now that we're not getting enough dirt so that suddenly there's more allergies than there have ever been. Now, maybe there's something similar with texture. We'll, we'll talk about the relationship with nutri- between nutrition and texture in a moment here. So, yeah, uh, but maybe smooth is, is some kind of separate category. Um, visual texture. And again, I think this might have something to do with the way things would feel if you could touch it. Interestingly enough, the people really most interested in how to create visual texture are the people working precisely with digital stuff. Why? They want to create an illusion of texture. And it's very important because we get kind of tired of these screens. Something happens to us when we're just in this white, sterile, or or just flat environment of flat colors. Um, Again, the Oxford Dictionary talking about visual texture says it's the tactile quality of the surface of a work of art. Now, now they're talking about what happens if you go up to a Jackson Pollock painting and you feel all of his lumps and bumps and splashes and drips. But I, I think that can't possibly be the only definition of texture related to painting. That is say, it can't simply be what the surface feels like. It has to also be the image itself. Just as um, if I watch the puppet films of Jan Schrankmeier, I just get this tactile sensation. He's, he's obsessed with tactile stuff. I actually interviewed him a few years back and I was really curious about this. And uh, why, why are you so interested in that? Um, so let's see. Then there's this really weird question of texture and music. And I say it's weird because we're no longer at all in the visual or tactile world. And yet, it's a very real thing. For instance, we use words like this, and there's a lot of writing on texture in music. So we use the following kinds of words to describe the texture of music. We use the word monophonic. Uh, Gregorian chants are monophonic. You just hear one voice go all the way through. There's nothing on the side. Homophonic is when you hear one predominant voice with, say, accompanying rhythm or harmonies. So, but still one voice. Uh, polyphonic, mentor, many interweavings of musical sounds. Um, and we often use tactile language to describe certain feelings evoked by music. But how does this fit into the largely tactile and visual world of uh, texture? Um, not so easy to say. Uh, again, the Oxford says the quality created by the combination of different elements in a work of music or literature, <laughs> which suddenly brings up a whole nother category of the possibilities of texture, which I'm not going to even pursue because it was just, obviously it's a rabbit hole and, and there's a lot that's connected to this concept, but let's talk about this. I think it's obvious there's a need for texture. Um, we need texture in life. I think human beings need the natural world for more than our biological needs. A lot of people will say, you know, as long as you've got all your biological needs met and, and also your sociological needs, you're fine. And I would disagree. That is, one can have food, water, clothing, warmth, sunshine, all the other imperatives of our, you know, like integral bodily functions, everything that they require. And yet, to merely have these things does not mean one has everything one's need. Consider a prisoner in a modern penitentiary. And think of what those modern penitentiaries look like. You know, no. You can have every, you know, you, they'll give you television in there. They'll give you all sorts of stuff. You can have all this. It doesn't, you're missing something big. Um, and then... uh Beyond the obvious, uh, beyond that, we obviously need a social environment that involves conversation, the human touch, things like that. And studies, studies in human psychology are quite explicit on this point. Babies that don't get held really suffer. You know, and they almost never recover from that. Uh, so we obviously need the human environment and we need conversation. People who live alone in the woods, first thing when they see people, it's like, I want to talk, you know. It's like you you can't just be alone. Human beings are not meant to be alone. Even even hermits, they're just hungry for a conversation. 
you know, maybe they can talk to God, but at some point we need our human environment. But besides these kinds of obvious needs, we got some kind of animal in here. Sounds like a buzzard. Anyway, could just be motorcycles. Um, besides these obvious physical needs, which are derived from nature, there seems to also be a need to feed our imaginations. And somehow in a way that we hardly seem to understand, we derive a great deal from just the the actual appearance and feel of the natural world. Uh, whether it's from animals or weather, but most of all from the images that come to us. So what do natural images consist of? Uh, interestingly enough, I think animals are, are really fascinating as a separate thing, which less to do with texture, more to do with relationships. Uh, because it's like there's music that's based on the, the, the voicings of various animals. I mean, I've got really primitive recordings of Swiss yodeling. And you know what they really sound like? Cows. I wonder why. <laughs> you know, uh, but you know, uh, the, uh, uh, but also the weather, all these things make an impression upon us. But, um, well, how does nature generally appear, uh, come to us? It comes, I think, in two general ways. The general panorama, there's the mountains, there's the forest, there's the valley, that kind of thing. The general panorama, and then kind of the fractal details. So the closer you get to a thing, for instance, then you'll see the individual trees, then the branches, then the leaves, then the veins on the leaves, and eventually, if you're so motivated, you do a scientific study on what's inside the leaves. Because we just get fascinated by that sort of stuff. So, I find that this is the way nature appears to us. is It's the desert, the mountains, the sky, this big thing, the plains, the Arctic, you know, the ocean. And then there's the details within it. And and we need both. We need the big panorama and we need the details. And our imaginations feed on these things. And I think that's just how we relate to nature in general, how it comes to us. Um, interestingly enough, human inventions in the past were originally de- uh, designed related to the objects found in the natural world. So you have wooden chairs. So if you're sitting on a wooden chair, if you look at it, you see the grain in the wood. Just as if you're sitting in uh, this room here, you can see the grain on the walls. And the interesting thing about that is not one of these two uh, uh, slats is alike. And that kind of corresponds to nature, where there's a general panorama, the walls, and then the more you focus in on it, there's the individual thing, the more specific. Uh, and you can think about this with like rock, rock walls. The, you know, think about the rooms you're staying in in your chalets, which are generally around here covered in wooden uh, paneling. And think about just the feel of that. Now, I could go on. I'm going to kind of sidestep now into an increasing absence of textures. How did this happen? You look at the world now. Uh, I call it the flatness of the postmodern world. Uh, let me tell you about walking again into the Les Isles Mall. I could tell you about any mall I've been into. Uh, the, the, when I, last time I was in Tbilisi, Georgia, they just put a new mall in there. It was like, I felt like the mothership had landed from an alien world. And and the the plastic, uh, instead, you know, they don't have marble on the floor because that's not too expensive. And what if you drop something on it, it'll break. So they have the cheapest plastic, shiny thing. It's like you're slipping on it, but it all looks the same. Kind of pseudo marbly, but all the same. Um, but then you see window upon window upon window upon window. Interestingly enough, people are really obsessed with windows and white spaces these days. Uh, in a way, I don't think they've ever been in the past. Um, uh, but but in Les Isles, like I said, it's like it's like these these large structures. Some of them are huge spaces. But w- what's interesting is there's nowhere to sit. Why? Sitting in public these days is a real problem. And because who gets attracted to it? People who are going to like leave a lot of smelly bodily odors behind. So they do things to prevent people from sitting and, and clustering. So you end up in this place and, and they've done st- psychological studies on these things that places without, uh, chairs in such people, it just really doesn't feel without something that people will look for anything to sit on. Anything to feel at home on. 
But our spaces, what's also interesting, this is on a totally different realm, is these new environments of the malls and such that we've created for ourselves are not public spaces. They are commercial spaces, which means you are... You might be free to say whatever you want within the context of your society, but you're not free to say whatever you want within the context of a mall in the same way, because it is someone's property. It's like you're in someone's house, and in their house they may say, you know, we just don't talk about that here. And they're fully within their rights to do so, but that's become our public space for so many people, malls, things like that. Um, but Or think about uh, hospitals. I mean, hospitals have become one of the least healthy environments you can possibly imagine. Or airports. Oh my goodness. I, there's a place, if there's any place I'd like to spend less time in my life, it's in the airports I have to take to get here. Uh, you know, it's just, or let alone the airplane itself. But, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, it, because there's something isolating and alienating about these environments. The, the, the structures are not meant, they're not really meant for humans. And we'll explain, I'm going to explain exactly why in a bit here. Um, or just think of working in an office in a large building. And, you know, uh, we used to call them cube farms in New York, uh, cubicles. And, and they've now done studies that cubicles just like totally deadening to human beings. I don't know if anyone ever saw that movie Office Space. It was pretty funny, but, um, yeah, cubicles and that whole office environment is just, deadening to what it means to be a human. We don't know exactly why. We just know that it's a problem. We know that it's that weird, I think it's the, the white, the, the, it's, it's kind of suffocating. Now as a Christian, I would love to be able to tell you that Christians have avoided these pitfalls in church construction. However, I can't tell you that at all. If you walk into any large modern church these days, they kind of look like a movie theater almost, which is not I mean, and I don't mean a good classic, like, 1920s movie palace. I mean, like, they look like a bad block. They've got, you know, everything we do now is for... We have utilitarian motives for everything. A lot of it based on uh, commercializations of the principles of modern architecture. And Christians don't think about texture any more than anybody else, as far as I can see. You know, we unfortunately live in a world where it's kind of like, hey... Those uh, fluorescent lights are cheap. Let's get them. It's going to save us money. And don't think about what it's like to live in that environment of fluorescent lights. Okay, so how did we get here? There is a slight origin, I would say, in some of the most severe Protestant churches uh, where they really wanted to get rid of all, certainly all signs of Catholicism, but all signs of ostentation and orientation. But even in these old churches, I find it textually to be pleasant. I don't, I've never had a real problem with them, but I can see the beginning of an idea in there. This stripping things down to its kind of most simplistic level. Uh, what we don't need can go. If we don't need it, it doesn't need to be here. Uh, kind of a uh, utilitarianism. Uh, there is an origin in art. Now, now, let me just paint you a picture. I don't know if you've ever seen photos of or been to an older style art gallery. Now, there's a, an interesting museum in Paris, the, the Museum for Gustave Moreau. And you walk in there, and it's like these really tall walls in an old studio setting. Uh, and there's painting upon painting. And this is how they used to be demonstrated. Or you walk into some grand palace, and there would be painting upon painting. And at a certain point, when the modern idea came along, they said, you know, you just can't even see the work. So what they said is, big white wall, painting, one painting, or maybe two on a wall. And they did this in order to, in a sense, clarify the, 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 the work. But in doing so, they also created the work became much more of an object alone in the wall. Now, that's one thing. And I often thought, where did this come from? Because this model of the art gallery eventually becomes the model for people's homes. I know in California growing up... <clears throat> There were some, I think this may be where all of this started for me. Uh, I lived for a while in a home that was like perhaps the deadest, flattest texture I've ever been in. Just white, bad shag carpet. We won't discuss that. That was the 70s. Uh, but just everything was white. And of course, sometimes they, they, they would realize we need some texture. And then they would spray this terrifying stuff called texture on the ceiling. And you touch it, it falls off. 
Um, but you see this also where people are realizing, yeah, we've got a bit too much flat white here, so let's texture it and then put really terrible looking textures on it. Um, nothing traditional. Uh, interestingly enough, this whole white house, white room concept kind of comes from places like Spain and uh, Scandinavia where you have interiors that were white, but always these older houses had textures. It was often rock walls with uh, kind of a cement texture with paint on, or, or some kind of uh, whitewash on it. And you, wherever you were sitting, you would see the texture. So it wasn't a flat white space, but it was certainly flatter and whiter than, say, this room. So, um, but, uh, there was an I mean, during the Victorian era, the, the age of the bourgeoisie in the 19th century, there was like a way overkill on or, ornamentation. And so people wanted to react to that. And so eventually, in the modern art of the early 20th century, they started to react to it. There was a movement in Germany called the uh, Deutsche Werkbund, which was the German Work Federation, which had a desire for more efficient and modern design. Now, what's interesting, though, is that word efficient. Um, modern is another one, but efficient. Why do we need efficient designs? Well, because they wanted to produce these things so that they, they weren't ostentatious and totally ornamented. But I think they went too far. In, uh, two of the f- most important people that came from this were uh, Walter Gropius and Ludwig uh, Mies van der Rohe. And these two people became the preeminent architects of the Bauhaus movement, whom we'll discuss in a moment. But, interestingly enough, uh, this movement was based on what's called the Arts and Crafts Movement in England. In the Arts and Crafts Movement in England, uh, William Morris was the spearhead of this, and he was really involved with medievalism. So he was connected to all the Pre-Raphaelite, pre-Raphaelite artists. And um, he, his own art, kind of looks like theirs. And he started making wallpaper. Eventually we would call the style that comes from William Morris Art Nouveau. And it was kind of based on things like Baroque style and and other kind of ornamental styles. But, you know, if you can picture, uh, I don't know, certain Paris metro stops or certain kinds of flowery wallpaper, it was all based on uh, vegetation and such like that. But the idea that, you know, there are all these vines on your wallpaper and such like this. But Interestingly enough, that was seen by this next group as being far too much ornamentation. So they, uh, they started getting, they had some other influences as well, including futurism and uh, Russian constructivism. And Russian constructivism is very angular and very much a revolutionary style. One of the things is William Morris was a socialist, and I think this was the key here. And I think all these people were kind of of a left-leaning socialist perspective. They wanted to produce something for everybody. But rather than produce something for everyone that was beautiful in a certain way, they wanted to create something for everybody that was, well, utilitarian. It was prosaic. It was like, we don't want some people to have these ornate, elaborate things. We want everyone to have just these boxes. Now, the first Bauhaus... uh, 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 Bauhaus uh, group came together and, and Walter Gropius was basically the uh, leader of it. He it, it created a school and some of their early buildings are quite interesting. Uh, there's also some uh, relationship here between uh, Bauhaus and what was happening in the Viennese secessionist period. Uh, some of the Art Nouveau related uh, symbolist stuff started simplifying the textures and kind of rounded peaks. But uh, but uh, Bauhaus took it to an extreme and Walter Gropius said we want an architecture adapted to our world of machines radios and fast cars let me read that again we want a, uh, an architecture adapted to our world of machines radios and fast cars and you know what I notice is missing there it's like me <laughs> it's not a world of me of humans, it's a world of machines. Now, interestingly enough, in the Italian futurists, uh, people like Marinetti were coming up with these manifestos that were all about the machine, but also the violence of the machine. That would eventually lead to fascism and to Nazism, the the worship of the strength of the machine, the power of the machine. But um, uh, out of this need for simplification 
and efficiency. We eventually had an architectural style, which uh, Philip Johnson later called in the 1920s the international style, and it ends up becoming the modern art style of the 20th century. I lived in New York City for 16 years, and I would go up to like the Seagram's building or the Pan Am building, these large grid-like structures, uh, absolutely lethal. Eventually, there was a style they just called brutalism, and 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 today it's like we 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 they were calling it brutalism because the French word brute means raw, but but in fact it became brute like beast, <laughs> you know it became brute like crushing, because some of this stuff there's a there's a railroad station in Tbilisi which is Soviet late Soviet period brutalism it's just like, <laughs> and in fact I've been uh, inside of some of the Soviet block buildings in Georgia, and it's like, wow. In a way, they're so frightening that I like them. <laughs> I mean, they're just, it's like, especially, now, well, the interesting thing about Tbilisi, the city, is it doesn't build up with a lot of suburbs. It just starts from the fields. So I took a bus ride to the edge of, outside of the town. I look back, and just arising from the field are these dark Soviet-era block buildings, which are on the outskirts of the town. And it just looks like, you know, you know the, the, the dark tower. But the, the ironic thing is the, the Georgians inside are all lovely people and there's no sense of fear at all. But in America, when we built these kind of brutalist structures, they just bred crime in places like the stairwells, in, in the fact that you didn't know who your neighbors were, in the fact that, I mean, I've lived in some pretty soulless buildings uh, I once talked with an architect in Switzerland when I first visited up here. Uh, and he, he was in Zurich, and he was an architect from Zurich, and he said, there's a general principle that if you build something over six stories, it starts to feel inhuman. Which then creates the question of why do... Who wants these things to feel so inhuman? Well, these are often civic planners, industrial planners, commercial planners. They're seeing their city... You know, it's just like they're looking across the water and there's the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center rising. I used to live in New York City. I, li- I worked down near the, the Trade Center all the time. I was not at all surprised that someone chose that. I was always thinking, that is the target I would... If I was a terrorist, I would be going for that target. Why? It is just so... It's such a statement of pride and arrogance and it was also quite an ugly structure. So it would just be like... You know, you could all, I, when I, when I heard about September 11th, I was going like, yeah, it had to be the World Trade Center. You know, what else would you go for there? It's just such a big thing that stands up in the middle. But now we have the, like I said, these new cities where it's just everywhere. Now what's interesting is it, it affected not only the architecture itself, but what was inside the arch, uh, architecture, the, what it would later be called design. So it's a whole area of where we design the stuff, the furniture, the, uh, the walls, the way things look, you know, light, light switches, things like that, everything. And, the, yeah. I think you're right about the, uh, the, the Bauhaus movement mm-hmm. working like they did. Uh, just to throw that in there. Sure. It's also a move from, from crafts and mm-hmm. handmade stuff into industrial production. Exactly, yeah. And, and that includes the social element, like you said, mm-hmm. and actually, Produce a piece like this in hundred copies and combine it right. with this piece over here, right. and then more people can get a nice chair. For exactly, it, less money. Exactly. So there's definitely the socialist idea. The, the extreme commercial example of that is IKEA. Oh, exactly. And interestingly enough, it has been the Scandinavian countries which are who are known for the design element. Uh, you know, we talk about, you know, uh, Danish modern or something in terms of chairs and furniture and such. Um, and, uh, I find it fascinating. If anyone's ever seen the movie, uh, The Shining, Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, which I don't think is the greatest horror film ever made, although I do like it and I've grown to like it more over the years, but I always, I was actually working in a large, uh, hotel in, um, Montana in a, the National Park, Glacier National Park, and they actually came and looked for, uh, when I was there to, uh, about, uh, whether they should use the interiors for us. And they didn't. They went instead. Stanley Kubrick created a, a very modernist interior for this hotel. The hotel I was in was scariest anything, but it wasn't modernist. 
it was all dark wood and everything. And I actually put, once played a hide and go seek game in there where we, at the end of the season, we turned all the lights off and we went through this rambling, massive hotel, which would stretch from here to the end of Waymo down there. Uh, 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 with flashlights and such. Scary. Well, we were, I was so disappointed when I saw the movie and I said, you didn't use any of those kind of interiors. You know, it was just like, that's really scary. But I understand now what he was doing. And that is he was using these really sterile environments. So if you think of 2001, his, uh, probably his masterpiece, you think of the sterility of his spatial vision for outer space. It's just like really weird. And yet that's the world that many people wanted to see. This, this blank, sterile world. I think our vision is different now. Interestingly, Bauhaus kind of got kicked out of uh, Germany because the Nazis came along. And they had their own ideas about architecture. weren't necessarily better. They were monumental, massive versions of like somewhat neoclassical structures. And uh, But nevertheless, what happened was the Bauhaus architects ended up being scattered, and guess what country they mostly moved to? America. And that's how New York City ends up with all of this uh, ar- post-war architecture. And then from there, you now see basically the floor plan for any up-and-coming major uh, metropolitan area is uh, these large mega structures. We've changed it a bit. It used to be the, the straight up and down. Now, if you think about places like Dubai or, or um, Kuala Lumpur or something, you have these kind of more... Uh, Postmodern structures where they have curves and stuff, they're not that much better in terms of human life underneath them, but they look a little uh, more interesting on some level. Uh, there have been critiques of modern architecture coming from architecture. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, who was always kind of a rebel and really wanted to integrate his architecture into natural environments, said, human houses should not be like boxes blazing in the sun, nor should we outrage the machine by trying to make dwelling places too complementary to the machinery. Let me read that again. Human houses should not be like boxes blazing in the sun, nor should we outrage the machine, capital M there, by trying to make dwelling places too complicated to, capital M, machinery. And I think he nails it, is that these people are too invested in this future in which mechanization, machinery, industrialization, technology is going to solve all of our problems. And it doesn't. Uh, Tom Wolfe wrote an, a book-length critique called From Bauhaus to Our House, which he portrays the modern style as elitist. And if you think about it, who are the people who actually are want this, this kind of world? Well, they're the civic, industrial, commercial developers and planners. It isn't the, uh, even the architects often are dismayed by what they have to make. They do it because uh, that's their job. But um, I've certainly found more than one architect um, <clears throat> who has, has questions about some of what they have been doing. So, besides all that comes from architecture, there's been a basic modernist desire to pull everything apart to find out how it works. So whether it's Picasso's cubism or, uh, you know, later abstract expressionism, that kind of artistic desire to pull things apart, to think of Mondrian's lines and things like that, or in the scientific world, to keep going further and further in, to pull things apart, to find out what they're made out of. Um, and I think a certain amount of this comes from that. Uh, eventually in art, you get movements like pop art and minimalism, which are extremely flat. Uh, flat surfaces. Uh, Jasper Johns is, is, for instance, his American flags are not flat, but Andy Warhol is like, uh, Lichten, Lichten, Lichtenstein is, is really flat. You know, and, the, and it, and it becomes about the flatness of the canvas. And these people are definitely reacting to Clement Greenberg, who was a critic, who talked about, you know, the, the, the surface of the canvas essentially being the stage. Whereas these people were saying, okay. And they just eliminated the surface of the canvas. Um, and this effect can be seen heavily in the graphic arts and in computer graphics. So all of these things eventually come to direct us, affect us directly through what we ingest. So, uh, I mean, I, I just think about book covers, for instance, if I think about graphic arts, just one small area. And I think about the way book covers looked in the 1950s, where you had often a painting 
with kind of an interesting font design on it and such like that. And you had to have put the money and how much it was worth, what company and whatnot. But it was a very kind of catchy cover of, a, of an actual painting. Later you would get, uh, you know, at a certain point you just got, once they discovered computer graphics, you just got this like two colors, one color, one color, words in the middle somewhere. And it was just like, wow, that was cheap. You know, but someone got paid for that and it was really flat as well. And, and just the textures of books went from being like cloth bound to these, I mean, nowadays, if you get a hardback book, sometimes you get the laminated cover right on it. Um, and we don't think about the accumulation of all these kind of shiny, uh, flat textures and, and, uh, I mean, just the whole thing of, uh, words on things is quite fascinating. Uh, you know, suddenly people are all wearing shirts that have sayings and pictures on them which kind of tends to tear down words and tear down the meaning of those images by making them this common thing. Yet we use these to as a source of identity for ourselves, which I'm going to come to in a minute here. Um, there's been a change in materials, and this is another important contributor to where we are. Uh, so, for instance, uh, you have the big, the big ones are like steel, shiny uh, uh not just steel, uh, what is it, uh, stainless steel. You have um, glass, nothing wrong with glass, but suddenly, I mean, I have friends in Alaska who have just A-frames with just nothing but glass on one side. And I'm saying like, okay, I get it, you want light in the house, but could this be overkill? What's it like to live among that much flat glass? You know, you can't have a bookshelf against that, you can't put anything against it because you want the light in the house. Um, plastic, a lot of stuff going on with plastic. I've almost gotten to the point where the only thing I really like on plastic anymore is uh, vinyl records, bowling balls. Like you, you can interchange those. They, there was a company that made bowling balls and vinyl records, and I wondered which way the vinyl was going. But, but no, there's so much plastic stuff. I remember just kind of regretting when all of these uh, glass jars were being taken out in the end of the 90s, glass bottles and being replaced with plastic bottles. And now we're finding out, oh, we kind of made a devil's bargain with this whole plastic thing. Because it's just clogging everything up with these micro particles of plastic. But even apart from the bio, the ecological thing, just what's it mean to live in a world... I, I have friends who have nothing but plastic... Uh, one can't call it silverware. Um, well, uh, plastic plates and glasses and such. And they, they often do this because they have children and they don't want them breaking, you know. But rather than teach children to live in a world where glass breaks, as, as you were saying, with smoothness and such, they teach them to live in a world where if you drop something there is no consequence. It just bounces. And yet that is not the world. Glass still breaks. So, um, and then we have, uh, I, I, and I remember when I lived in New York City watching neon signs being, the old style kind of ornate, almost baroque neon signs of the 40s and 50s being replaced by these flat plastic, um, I don't know what to call them, flat, uh, huh? Light boxes. Yeah, thank you, that's an excellent. Light boxes with glowing, uh, plastic uh, block uh, sans serif letters through it. And it suddenly it started to happen everywhere with this kind of plastic on it coming over. And I just, after a while I started seeing it more and more and more and I just said like, gosh, this is really affecting the way things look and feel here. Um, and then there's faux materials, which I find really strange. So, why would someone imitate wood? You either like wood or you don't. You know, for instance, I have friends in, again, in Alaska who put Vinyl siding on their house. It's supposed to look like wood siding. I mean, well, heck, if you're going to use plastic, why not shape it into, you know, your favorite, I don't know, Flintstones television episode or something. You know, put it on... Does, does Flintstones that you are? Okay, Simpsons. Put it on, you know, make it something like crazy, because it's plastic. You can do whatever you want with it, but instead they want it to look like wood. And what's the point of that? What's the, the point of Dunkin' Donuts? Uh, they have these faux wooden... They used to, I don't know. It just it, it, There's so much... False material. I once went to Disney World. My mom wanted to go there on a holiday. And I said, I don't want to go to Disney World. She goes, well, I'll pay. And I said, okay, I'll get some sociological, philosophical benefit out of this. Um, so I went, and I was amazed. I was in a fake Victorian uh, beach resort from the 19th century, but it was you know made like in the 1980s or so, on a fake beach. 
that had a monorail going through it in a, in a place that had imitations of like Mexico and Norway, <laughs> you know, in the Epcot Center. And all this shiny, weird, fake stuff. And I'm going like, this is the world we're choosing to surround ourselves with. These weird textures and, and designs and such. If you ever spend time looking at photos from, say, 1950s, 1940s, 1950s, look at a crowd photo. Look at the way people are dressed in those photos. And now find someone who looks like they don't fit. They all fit. They all look like they're from the 1940s and 50s. But if you look at a crowd photo of, say, Times Square today, most of those people don't look like they fit anywhere. They just, I mean, it's just random clothes. And a lot of our clothes textures are flat, a lot of synthetic clothes textures. I remember the hippies were really against synthetic uh, textures. They had a real rebellion against that. And now you meet people who are older hippies who are like bicyclists wearing like, you know, practically being slipped into their synthetic garb and they and they don't question it anymore. They don't ask questions about the nature of the fabric. They just simply accept that this is what a bicyclist looks like now. You know? Um, and then there's the effect of the screen. You know that I was telling you like I, I was in this one house uh, that I was renting when I was young, younger, and it was just, we, we went in there, it was like dead flat white. The only thing you can do with that space is put a television in it. Because that's what you're going to be looking at. You're not going to be looking at the walls. People tend to decorate these things with posters they bought from somewhere, which they look reproduced. They don't have that. I really like individual wall coverings that look like I'd never see this anywhere else. It's individual. It really represents these people somehow. But to go somewhere where everything seems to be an imitation or something they bought from something that is just a reproduction of something, uh, photos or posters or whatever that just seem like endless reproductions. Um, but the screen is kind of the ultimate thing. This is now the thing we put everywhere. And so it, there's kind of a history of the screen from, say, Shadow Puppets, which I love, to the movie screen which I certainly have a great fondness for, to television, which I have a little less fondness for, to the computer, which I feel kind of chained to, to the smartphone, which quite positively feels like a psychotic break. What do I mean? I was just in the Louvre. And I went, I got there on the free morning, once once a month on Sundays, it's free. I just arrived there the day before. I said, you know, it's, I haven't been to the Louvre since 1987. Let's go again. And I thought, like, I was almost the first in line. No, not almost. There was probably about 100 people in front of me, it seemed. It seemed. There were more somehow hidden away. I said, let's go down and look at the Mona Lisa before they all get there. Couldn't do it. I mean, I got there. But the Mona Lisa was like a feeding frenzy of pigeons. And this is how people were looking at the Mona Lisa. I have a film I just put on. I have a website, Gravity from Above, where I write about my trips. I just wrote about my Paris adventures. I just made a YouTube video because I realized I wasn't here to see the Mona Lisa. I really wasn't. I was there to see the people looking at the Mona Lisa. This is how they did it. They walk into the room. Let's say, this is the Mona Lisa. They walk in, this big rope here, you can't get close to it. There's hundreds of people back here. They walk in and do this. They get their phone out. They would, you'd see it in the back. They'd get it and they'd go, Shh! and then they'd turn and they would walk in. That is what the smartphone has done to us. There is no more reality left at all. And if, and what's gonna happen is those people are gonna go back to their social media account, put that on, People are going to go click, like, heart, whatever. And they're going to say, I saw the Mona Lisa. And I can tell you one thing from watching them. I didn't see the Mona Lisa because I was too busy watching the spectacle in front of it. And I didn't get close enough to say, I saw it. I know I did see it, but I didn't see it. They didn't see it whatsoever. And that is how people are dealing with reality now. That is the ultimate thing that this flat world has brought to us is this replacement of the real world with, I mean, in Alaska, 
we ha- I take people on tours. Uh, sometimes I take them on tours to see bears. And other times I take them on tours uh, to go rafting. But I get people off of cruise ships who sometimes are confused about where they are. I mean, one of the classic ones is there's a there's a ramp right off of the uh, fjord. So the fjord is the ocean. Are we on this page? Right. So that during a low tide, we have a pretty low tide. People come up. There were two women. Get the ferry worker listens to them coming off, and one woman says, "Oh, I'm getting dizzy." When she gets to the top of the ramp, and the other woman goes, "I know it's the elevation." <laughs> or try this. There's a woman on one of our raft trips. At the end of the raft trip, it's a day kind of like right now. Pleasant, a little on the cool side, but not unpleasant at all. And she's sitting on this bench, and she's looking real down. And we, one of the one of the guides goes up and goes, what's wrong? And she goes like, oh, I'm just so disappointed. I was expecting Alaska to be warm, like Hawaii. And we said, where did you get that idea? She says, well, they're next to each other on the map. She thought they were the little indentations at the bottom of the USA map. And, and, and I could go on with those kind of stories endlessly. How do those kind of things happen? Well, it's because we all have certain areas in which we would be considered stupid. That is, say, if I went to buy a, I don't know, uh, a water heater tomorrow. I don't know anything about water heaters. So I would do a little bit of research online, but I still wouldn't know. And as soon as I entered the store where they sell them, they would know. And they, just whatever I said next, they'd give it away that I didn't know much. Just as when I used to work in the music industry and I worked in a record store, someone would come in and give me a list of stuff to buy for someone. I, we'd immediately re- recognize we're dealing with an amateur. You don't actually know anything about music. Whatever it is that's on that list, you don't know anything about it. So, you know, that's just how it is. We all have places where we'd be ignorant. Well, this is what people know about now. They look in their hands and they do the little things and they and they know about the text they're getting today, and they know about what they're waiting to hear about, and they know about putting the camera up in front of themselves on other objects. But they no longer know much about the stuff that's not on the screen. And that's the world we're living in. And that's kind of scary. So, interestingly, I thought about the whole smoothness thing in nature. Where do we find smoothness in the natural world and flatness? Well, one place we find it is in ice, on a lake. The interesting thing about that is there are two interesting qualities about it. One, it's breakable. And two, it's cold. Which I think are very interesting qualities. Um, And I think that the buildings we build to look eternally shiny kind of say something about our misunderstanding of the nature of reality. Because nothing is going to be eternally shiny. Except... You know, the new heaven and the new earth. But uh, in a sense, what we're making, I think, is is an imitation of heaven. That we build these beautiful, great buildings. But And I was told once, though, well, Burn, you're not thinking about the architecture correctly. The way you're supposed to see it is like a crystalline structure, another thing which is smooth, a crystalline structure from a distance. I said, well, yeah, so certain structures from a distance look really beautiful. But what about the people who actually have to work in those places or live under them? You know, um, some leaves are kind of smooth, but they're not flat. Um, crystals usually not that big, but they are very breakable. Skin now, the skin is rounded, not really, not really truly flat or perfectly smooth. In fact, the texture of human skin is so distinctive that it often makes up the whole point of various works of art. And so I don't think skin is in here. In fact, we often use, for instance, a model against some extremely modernistic background in order to make a contrast between the human and the the thing behind her. So what is the human situation in the flat world? Okay, so by the mid-20th century, something had happened. People started to go with the change. If you look at the way people dressed in the early 1960s, I don't think clothing has ever been more angular or or straight. Uh, and then, um, I mean, and and women's dresses were very straight and angular and such. 
But then, against this flat backdrop, people began to rebel. And so you first see this with the hippies. And suddenly people grow their hair, guys grow their hair long, they start growing beards, women start wearing more, mm, more uh, organic textures and such. But then what happens in the next 50 years is suddenly it's like someone opens up this box and it's like every style on earth comes out. It, well, not every style, but every style of the last 50 years. So we have suddenly, I mean, you see with hair, it's like you have long hair, dreadlocks, skinheads, punk hair, shaved heads on women, mohawks, big goth hair, faux hogs, people wearing marine jarheads as civilians, long beards, stylized short hair. It just goes on and on and on. Uh, you also see this with tattoos, piercing, scarification, fetish wear, unusual textures like rubber, uh, very blatant use of synthetics, often, uh, but also with a lot of the uh, uh, neo-primitive stuff uh, related to uh, rejection of this dominant large culture as, as part of a, a kind of rebellion into a primitive culture. Um, then you, and, but what you end up seeing is, for instance, picture this... Uh, some kid into heavy metal. He's wearing like a black leather jacket. He's got tattoos. Maybe a hand, you know big handlebar mustache. Looks like a Cossack mustache or something, right? And this guy has got like leather boots. And he's got like chains on and such. And he's standing in a shopping mall carrying a plastic bag with the logo of you know, Fnac or or, or uh, I don't know, Target on it or something. And he's reduced to being a caricature. A, a wannabe. Uh, it's like, and that's all of us. We are all reduced to that in these in these worlds because we don't actually fit in that world. We look silly. Here's this guy, I mean, and I can think of so many people who, have, you know, I, I have friends who've got you know like, massive holes in their ears and dreads and yarn extensions and all this stuff, and I'm sitting there going like, yeah, but as soon as you get near the stuff that actually makes up our society, I hate to say it, but we look kind of silly because we don't look like we fit in at all. And the people who look like they do fit in are often wearing whatever the latest trend is for a few minutes. And then that disappears. And my feeling is, well, what ends up happening is we're kind of being reduced to almost like kitsch. We end up being these, these goofy looking characters in a, in like a De Chirico painting, but with instead of the, the De Chirico's painting, it's always a lone figure with this strange, uh, uh, emptiness in the background, but we're like the funny figure in this strange emptiness in the background. And one of the things I worked in, when I also was in New York, I spent about four years working in the art world, and I saw lots of really interesting art. And then what I would see is every time you'd bring it into the gallery, the white walls of the gallery would turn it into the art object. And back in the guy's studio, or the woman's studio, it looked really fascinating. And then out here it's just like, you know, fetish object. And I thought... Someone has to go in and deal with the context before you deal with the art. Because it's the context that's the problem. So, and, and that's what I think Christians should be doing, but I think everybody should be doing, is dealing with what's in context that we should be living in. Because otherwise, this other context of tech, this technological flat world we've been is going to get to us. How does texture affect us finally? Consider this. Consider wherever you're from, and consider what it's like being here. Think about the room you're probably staying in. Think about the dark wooden walls. Do you feel, I mean, what a lot of people say about space and whiteness is, I, I need the space. Do you feel like you need the space? I mean, maybe somebody here does for whatever reason. But does it really harm you to be around dark wooden walls? doesn't harm me at all, personally. I find myself kind of liberated. feels cozy. I mean, I have friends who have extremely high ceilings, and I just can't figure it out, especially in Alaska, where the heat's going up there. We don't live up there. We live down here. So why are you sending it all up there? Just because you want this weird idea of space. It's just like, well, why not a weird idea of coziness? Because that, that's kind of interesting. More human, in a sense. But I think that... Uh, Texture, in a sense, is like nutrition. Uh, we've already seen what happens if you try to perfect, say, the substance of milk, bread, eggs. 
And there are people, particularly in America, who are really great at doing this, of taking these things and extracting them into the most easily commercially viable product and having omitted so much of the nutrition of the product along the way. And I think that that's what we've done with our spatial textural world. We've extracted a lot of the nutrition from it. So what is the effect of constantly being in dead environments like workplaces, schools, a lot of dead schools out there, uh, uh, office buildings, uh, uh, hospitals, uh, um, airports. What's the effect of all of this stuff upon us? Quite frankly, we don't know. No one's really done any studies on this. I can take my guesses as to what I think, but I think what we've been doing is conducting radical experiments on ourselves, and we don't really know what the answer is. It's a forbidden experiment to try to solve this problem. And that is, what would happen if you took twins, separated them, let one grow up in an environment full of the textures of life, and let the other one grow up in a completely dead, sterile world? I am sure there would be differences. But since that would be a forbidden experiment, I am pretty sure we don't know. But it did happen once. In reality, there was a girl who we call her Jeannie. She has another name, but that's to protect her identity. I do believe she's still alive. In about 1970, this girl was found at about 13 years old. Her mother took her out of the house she had been living in, in the suburb of California. Uh, she spent the first 13 years of her life completely isolated from images and except what was in the room, white walls, and plastic toilet trainer that she was strapped to and the plastic crib that she was left in. Her father, uh, as soon as it uh, was evidently a very controlling, abusive man, the only things she, he would say to her are words like, no, stop. Finally, her mother, who doesn't, after 13 years, you make you wonder about her, decided to take her to some social workers. And then they all went, their hair stood on end. And the girl had no... Now, Now, what had happened was when they got her out of there, they said, okay, well, we've got to deal with this. The father ended up killing himself. We don't know anything about his motives. But uh, she was left... Uh, they, they, they said, oh, well, we better take her away from the mother, too, because evidently the mom's got a problem as well. So suddenly scientists suddenly saw that another forbidden experiment had been performed on her. And that is what happens if you isolate a child from language. And what they realized is if you go so far, you cannot then start to learn language. You, she lost, she was able to learn words, but she was not able to learn grammar. Now that's what they learned at the time. However, when I first read this story, what attracted to me, or her to me was the flat environment. Here was a person in a white box, growing up in a white box. Now, when she got out, evidently she had difficulty communicating anything directly. However, she was extraordinarily expressive with her eyes and just her sense of touch and stuff. And the first time they took her to the ocean, she just couldn't even take it in. It was just like, imagine never having seen the ocean, but now not having no reference to what an ocean is. But here's the interesting thing. This is what she got fascinated with. Can you guess what she got fascinated with? The sand. No, not the ocean, but plastic. That's the only thing in her environment. So there is some relationship between the things we surround ourselves with and who we are. And we don't know her story. What happened was eventually her mother got the courts to give her back to her. And then her mother put her into a facility where she was treated essentially like a vegetable. And that's what we know. Sad story. Um, Unfortunately, the scientists have a lot to blame too. So, to wrap it up, we need to consider what we surround ourselves with. To consider what kind of life we are making for ourselves and for others. Is it a world of flat, dead objects more suited to a machine world? Or is it a world where, is it a world where the flatness of the screen is central, the central feature? Or is it a world full of textures and characters? Christians have mostly gone with the flat, dead textures and screens. 
Uh, my own commitment to texture and meaning has been like this. I've been thinking about these things for a long time without really re- recognizing what I was doing. But I would do things like, at a certain point in the 1980s, I started not buying paperback books anymore to the degree I could. And I would save my money and buy a cheaper hard used hardback copy. And then I would take off the ugly the graphic wrapping paper and stick the cloth on the shelf. And so if a person walks into my library, they are surrounded largely by cloth textures. And it seems to have a very beneficial effect on people. If you walk into my room, I, I have a certain rule. Nothing reproducible by machine is visible, that is say posters and such, is visible in my main living area. So it's got to be art. It's got to be interesting objects found in places. Um, and the reason is because I think we need that. And when you're sitting in someone's house and if all I have to look at is dead space and and uh, kind of posters, which I'm done with in a couple of seconds, I think, you know, if I get stuck in a room like this, I start looking at those textures of the uh, the wood and such. I start, I don't know what I'm thinking, but I start engaging with them and start looking at the different knots and things like that. And so it's a question of how, what kind of nutrition are we going to make for ourselves and for others? Because also we invite people into our lives. And so if our world is a dead world, then that's what we are passing on. But if our world is a world of textures, then we are not only giving nutrition to ourselves, but to others as well. So I'll stop there. So, um, like I said, those are kind of my preliminary thoughts on the subject, obviously a lot of them. But if you have any, if, if I sparked any thoughts, feel free to either ask questions or make comments or whatever. Yeah. One of the things that um, early on when you were talking about how we have to have textile stuff, a lot of people when they're watching movies, they think of like holograms and we, we think that that's what we're going to advance to. But most, most people who work in holograms oh, yeah. say that we're not actually going to get to that because there's no textile. Exactly. Like it's actually just like a false hope. And yeah. It's actually kind of reverses what we're I know a lot about that. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like the holy grail of, uh, of visuals is to get to a, th- a completely immersive three dimensional experience. And uh, we come a bit closer in a virtual bubble than we do with that. But still, and I think if we get there, people will be so tempted to live there. And it'll be, I mean, I I already see there's definitely addictions that go beyond the chemical that deal with our vision and sight and such. Yeah. When I was studying chemistry, I had two friends who were studying architecture. And they at a certain point told me, and they were totally convinced that concrete is a natural product. I thought, what is this about? And then they were being really told by the professor that concrete, great concrete, is, an, uh, is a, a natural product and it gives people nice feelings. And those two students just accepted those teachings without question. And I thought, are you crazy? Later, they were thinking about it, and what have I said? I said, maybe this is something you say. The professors teaching them were the same professors who were the architects of the biggest flat building structures in the Netherlands, the Bijlmermeer, which became also a big social disaster in the Netherlands, like you talked about the big flat buildings in America. Mm-hmm. So there is something of a sort of madness there that high valued architects who produce an absolute total disaster go then teach whole generations of architecture students who are programmed to make things of flat concrete and and, and I agree that everybody loves that and they don't understand it anymore they even were court cases in the Netherlands about a judge refusing to use the courtroom of pure concrete but which was made by architects saying that this is a good place to work in for a judge and everything so there is some this, it somehow relates to what you say mm-hmm. that they sort of in this case it was not plastic with concrete but it's similar that the flatness and the smoothness and the boringness of it mm-hmm. was sort of sanctified mm-hmm. and it's still beyond me right. but it's really it's happening although I notice in Europe more than in America when they do make cement things they tend to put uh, patterns in them uh, more so than in America America tends to use just the dead flat and and of course they some people really specialize in the super smooth you know so yeah uh, just 
a kind of a random question, but um, do you think how we relate to texture could affect how we relate to God? That's an interesting question. And uh, and it relates, I think, to things like the faux materials and stuff. That we can have a false idea of the nature of the world and that somehow that can interfere with our idea of who God is. You know, because I, I definitely feel like, I mean, I, I like I say, in, in tourism in Alaska, I definitely feel like people who have never, have no conception of what nature is come there. And if you have no conception of what nature is, for instance, if God is speaking to us in nature in some way, how would you know what he's even saying? You see? So it, it must have some relationship, but I would certainly not want to say what. And uh, it's something to think about, though, you know. And there could be a relationship here with maybe the some sort of Platonism. You have the whole physical world with textures and feelings and wetness and whatever, which is bad. In the spiritual world, without any feelings, only thoughts and images, is mm-hmm. an ideal, and that's what we go for. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe the architects are working on their ideal of a city which is just like shining from a distance, but the closer you get into it, the more problematic it becomes. Yeah. I think there's definitely, you're definitely onto something there. Yeah, Walker. it's an interesting... The, the Greco-Roman definition of aesthetics have definitely played out in, in modern art. And modern art has influenced architecture quite a great deal. So when you're saying, where did all these white flat spaces come from? I would say, well, they came from the temple. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But not the, the temple built in Jerusalem, but the right. temple built in in, in Athens and, and, and Rome. Mm-hmm. So the art museum or the art gallery becomes the new temple. And that's what we repeat in our interior designs and in our architecture. Mm. That's, that's an interesting thought. Mm, that's good. Yeah. Mike, Mike. Um, yeah. How do you think the relationship is between the rise of perfectionism in culture and the sort of, I guess, rise of perfectionism is a direct result of hyper individualism? When you say perfectionism, what are you referring to? Are you talking about moral perfectionism or are you talking about per- perfect buildings and structures or something like that? I guess um, control is what I think of when I think of perfectionism. Mm-hmm. The, idea of self built basically self worship and self god mm-hmm. and um, the lack of ability to deal with outside factors. So you have more control when there's less what we would call chaos. So yeah, well one of the things I didn't mention was for instance in all of this uh, there's the idea for instance if you think of if you've been in anywhere well even the Labrie kitchen has elements of industrial design in it because it was made as a, uh, essentially a, something like a hospital kitchen originally. If you go into most industrial kitchens, you're going to find, for instance, the flat textures of stainless steel and easily cleanable stuff. But it basically lets control this. That's the reason hospitals look the way they do. Uh, I don't have any answer to how you could do a hospital differently uh, because they become so much about sterility, which is about control. We want to control our environments, and so much of this modern stuff allows you to clean and sanitize things better. So I think there is a a connection. I think we do want a perfect world. I think we want our technology to create it for us. And I think in there there's some real problems, some serious problems. That And and those problems are talking about our relationship to God. I mean, when I've been to larger churches... um, I get uh, there's something I can't put my finger on, but it seems to permeate the whole congregation, especially the larger the congregation. There's almost like that this structure somehow relates to this what this larger congregation is going to be doing. I can't quantify it at all. I, I, all I know is I feel it when I'm in that setting. I just got a thought of, uh, what, have you ever talked to a blind person about what they, uh, perceive as texture? I know you mentioned visual texture and some other things with the eyes, but, and then you mentioned the tactile texture, but for a blind person, have you ever? I have I, a little, but not as much as I would like, and I think that would be a fascinating avenue of exploration. Yeah. Just going off the back of that, I think, I know you touched on it, but I think, 
there's such a massive connection between emotion and texture and like coming from my background in fashion mm-hmm. there's like so many studies that talk about like why people dress the way they do and a lot of it is based off emotion and if I think if most people in this room ask themselves how do you get dressed in the morning it's based off how you feel if you're feeling down cold depressed whatever most likely you're going to reach to a soft knitted wool jumper you're going to reach to a worn oversized t-shirt something like that and I think yeah there's such a massive connection between emotion mm-hmm. and texture and the same is like a, st- a stressful why why is that such a release mm-hmm. for people that soft um, squishy texture right and I would say go ahead right. <laughs> finish up same with food like why is texture such a massive part of the way that we interact and enjoy or don't enjoy food. If you ask most people why they just like mushrooms, most of the time they'll say the texture. When, in fact, like, we base our view on different foods, like, based on the, what, the way our palate responds to it. And yet, with, like, things like mushrooms, most of the time people say the texture of it. And I think it's, like, same with sex, why is touch such a big part of sex mm-hmm. so I think there, like, there's so many connections between right. texture and, and, and the whole tactile nature of things by the way I mentioned uh, human skin and stuff I, it, next week I uh, hope to be able to do my lecture on beauty and if I do I deal with some of these issues but um, I think that uh, you're, uh, there's probably the best and most coherent writing on textures coming from people who understand fabric and and that. Then there are larger questions that are interesting, like, for instance, why do whole periods of time dress so radically different than other periods of time? And just like, you know, why did the Victorian age, you know, uh, the women were like, you know, like completely sewn into their costumes, whereas we tend to go just the opposite. Where we're, I mean, sometimes I just look at my fellow Americans, I just go like, we are such slobs. You know, and we, uh, it's all about convenience and comfort and nothing at all about appearance. Yeah. And it's often related to the economic climate and mm-hmm. how people are responding to yeah. that as well. Yeah. And that affects their yeah. emotions and yeah. their way Yeah, see, the, the, what, what I wanted with this lecture, and maybe it's working, is, is, is just a key in the door to open the question. Because I think there's, uh, no one's really thought about this for a long time. There's a lot of aspects. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I really find this, this fascinating. Last time I had a uh, conversation with a student who was asking me about fashion. Mm-hmm. And it was an interesting conversation, but it really made me, really made me think. And he was saying, is there anything as a theology of fashion? And I was like, wow. Yeah. Well, it's something I've been thinking about for a long time because yeah, I've been interested in it too. since I originally came here 40 years ago. And, the, and what we were what we were discussing was, well, it's, it it seems like with hyper individualism that fashion has changed in from being part of something into being more like this is my expression mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. of something, or for for many other people, well. Fashion is not really a matter of a personal statement. It's a matter of function. Mm -hmm. Well, that's modern too. Yeah. Stripping away all decoration, this is purely function. Mm -hmm. In that sense, you can talk about jeans being a uniform. Yeah. Or you can say a a fleece sweater is, well, it's purely function. It, Mm -hmm. it, 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 or what do you call this, a rain jacket material that's able to, to, to push out the, Excessive moisture on the inside while yes. blocking. Wick away the moisture, yes. Yeah, yeah. Basically, like, <laughs> basically like a construction membrane that you put in insulation in your room. Oh, yeah. Like that. so it's an extreme functionalism. Well, yeah, and I find that people will wear, for instance, whatever sorts of, uh, rain gear that's, uh, usually got some sort of very synthetic base to it without ever saying to themselves, I mean, they would choose this brand over that brand, you know. Uh, without ever asking themselves, what do I look like in this as a human being? And I think that's one thing. What's interesting is on one level, we've become more self-conscious than ever. People take photos of themselves all the time. We're always imagining what we look like. We always see it. But on the other hand, 
we're kind of not aware of how we appear. We just, so we kind of like dress down and just become these things. And, and, it, and it's a big issue, I think. Yeah. Just, just to finish off. Sure. Sorry. No, not a problem. Uh, what, what the discussion led to with the student was, well, if you wanted to start discuss fashion and theology, then the question is le- less of how do I express myself, but how do I involve a kind of, of love for the neighbor in my fashion? So in that sense, what is good, hospitable fabrics? Mm-hmm. That was the conversation. Exactly. Had, and it, was, it was really interesting. Yeah. How do you actually make clothes that are not just considering you, but actually considering... You know, how are you hospitable yeah. to, to the person that comes yeah. into your home? Yeah. So there is, maybe we can talk about hospitable texture. Well, we've, we live in very individualistic times. And so people tend to think of whatever I like is good. But, but, uh, as Tarkovsky said about art, the purpose of art is not to just simply, is not simply self-expression, but to be a servant. And I think that there's whole realms of, you know, like when we're talking about fashion and clothing or whether we're talking about art or whether we're talking about, you know, if you have the chance to build your own home, what are you going to do? You know, and in Alaska, that happens all the time. And it's amazing to me, you know, there are some nice homes and it's amazing all the bad textures people have. I mean, they may, they now have plastic uh, bathtubs and they're really terrible, but they're cheaper to send up to Alaska than a cast iron claw hammer bathtub or something, you know, it's like, and, but when you stand in them, you just like totally, you know, and they're not deep enough for an actual person like me to take a bath. And, uh, but they're, they're wobbly. They're weird. And, and it's like plastic, uh, toilet bowls, which is really strange to me, you know? And then what happens to the plastic when this thing is over? It will be over at some point. Well, we know what happens to the porcelain. It kind of just goes back into the ground as it, maybe it's broken, goes to the city dump it acts like a rock, like glass does. But what does plastic do? You know, so people tend to make these... We don't think about ourselves. I actually got in trouble when I was young. I started thinking about this stuff a long time ago. It was sometime in the mid-70s. I, I was uh, kind of... My church sort of licensed me to preach. Which, whatever that means. I don't know what that means. What's the difference between that and an ordination? But it was subordination of sorts. And... Um, so I gave up and I gave a, a sermon. I'd given Bible studies and such before, but in this I was talking about the effects of the modern world upon us. And I, and I spent a while talking about the effect of the refrigerator. And afterwards, the pastor came up to me and said, what are you talking about? <laughs> because what I was saying was so weird to him that I would like mention something about anything to do with a refrigerator in that sort of context. Um, and But what I was talking about was exactly what I was talking about now. It was just I didn't have the language to even describe that we didn't know what we were talking about. But I just felt it. I mean, why do most people seem to clutter up their refrigerators with little magnets and stuff just to hide the thing? Because it's such a, it's like a Stanley Kubrick's monolith from 2001. It's just, you know, and and that's what some of our appliances are like. So I'm, I'm not sure that's the best, you know, I, you know, I, there actually have been in the past, uh, older refrigerators, the kind that were really cool that had the little coil on top and they had wooden, uh, outer s- sections and they were really nice. Occasionally you get that effect when you have, uh, black refrigerators with, uh, kind of a faux wood texture, but then again, faux wood. But the question is, it, it affects all of our lives. And you know, I don't think anybody can truly go through everything and get rid of all the ju- all this debris. There's just way too much of it. I mean, it's just like I had to live for the last 21 years with bad linoleum fake tiles on the ground. And it's just like, oh, what are you going to do? It's it's just too much to go through. The, everything that they're handing you and strip it all away and create some perfect world because we can't have a perfect world. But nevertheless, to find a way to make a world for... For me, someone coming to my house, someone meeting me, it's not about me. It's about them. And so I want a world, for instance, in my life, my house would be a world where people can ask questions. So I try to put objects around the house that they might say something about. Or not. It doesn't matter to me. Or not. Okay. So, well, thank you. And uh, I'll see you around. Feel free to ask me any more questions about this stuff.
A people without history is not redeemed from time. For history is a pattern of timeless moments.